Welcome to the podcast, Food Talks. I'm Dallas Townsend. I will be your host. And I act as the uninformed consumer asking a nutritionist all the questions that you have. Hello, I'm Jordan Townsend. I'm our resident nutritionist here at Naturally You, and I'm here to inform the uninformed consumer, answering and helping to unpack some of your more difficult nutrition questions. Today, we are going to talk about the liver. Now, I'll be honest with you, Jordan. I don't know anything about the liver. I know that you can damage it by drinking too much alcohol, but hopefully you can elaborate on that for us. Yeah, I'd like to do that, and I hope we have several of these episodes in the future where we just kind of go into the sort of the unsung functions of a lot of these organs. Because what you just said is really interesting, because when I even talk about people's liver, like when we're doing our testing and we're doing a body scan and we get to their liver and the liver's weak, most of the time people look at me and go, oh, it's probably that wine or it's probably, you know, too many beers. That's our immediate first association with the liver. Now, the liver is in charge of alcohol synthesis and production, but the thing that most people don't understand is every single thing that you eat goes through the liver, meaning if it's a food, if it's a medication, if it's alcohol, the liver is the first line of defense. That's the part of the body that's going to take in that product, metabolize it, change it, process it, then redistribute it, get it back out into the body where it needs to go what it needs to do so the liver is kind of interesting and that's why we're starting with that organ as far as your body is concerned the liver might be the most important organ because you're familiar with dialysis right yeah yeah, so that's for the kidneys because the kidneys are another filter organ there is no synthetic way to filter and do what the liver does for you so if you have liver failure you're pretty much dead unless you get a liver transplant it's that it's simply that complex of an organ that we can't even we can't even get close to replicating. We can put a man on the moon, but we can't replicate the liver. Yeah, now, and the reason for that being is specifically for the liver. It does over 500 unique functions in the body. So I kind of want to start with some of the basic ones and get down to some of the more complex ones. Because as far as the liver goes, like I said, it, it's almost too much. I don't think we could even fit in one podcast every single individual thing your liver does. But we'll start with the simple stuff. The main thing your liver's doing for you is converting every single food you eat into a usable form. As you probably know, when you initially eat something, that's not in a form your body can use. So whether it's carbs, whether it's a T-bone steak, whether it's coconut oil, the liver is the first line of all of that. So the liver is what takes these, essentially think, unusable compounds, these huge molecules as far as your body's concerned gets them down into forms that we can use. We call some of these glucose, that's just C6, H12, O6. Uh, Medium or short chain fatty acids are what it takes, big long chain fatty acids like butter and olive oil and reduces them down. And then amino acids. Amino acids come in these huge complex molecules. Your body gets them down into easy, or more importantly your liver, gets them down into really easy usable versions of those things. So that's what most people don't understand. Everything that comes in, the liver is what actually does the work behind it. So that's where we start to get confused in that we mostly think of stuff like alcohol. And we also, it's very common knowledge that stuff like Advil, Tylenol, different things like that are very hard on your liver. Well, of course, your liver is the one who's doing that metabolic work, actually has the enzymes that break those things down, turn them into something that once it's in the bloodstream can be used by the body. The problem we forget is, remember, those cookies are just as hard on your liver as alcohol. Those crackers that you Why eat. Why is that? So it's because what they are. Alcohol, is, a, or ethanol specifically, what we call alcohol, is just a different form, as far as your body's concerned, of, of, of energy. Because remember, there's, there's three macro groups. There's proteins, there's fat, there's carbs. Alcohol is actually the fourth group. You can use alcohol for energy production. So that's why it goes through the liver and, and is used that way. So the thing is, as far as your liver is concerned, it's just taking th- any source of fuel and making it to something you can burn. So think about your liver kind of as an oil refinery. So you put in crude oil, you get gasoline, you get diesel, you get all, you get kerosene, you get all these different forms out the other side, depending on what you eat. So that's why carbs specifically are so hard on the liver. With, again, whether it be sweet tea. This is what's kind of hard for people to hear and understand, whether it be a Coca-Cola, whether it be any of these things. 
that's all putting a huge burden on your liver specifically. So that's what we see with so many clients is they get their liver shows up. They go, Jordan, I don't drink alcohol. You eat crackers? <laughs> you like dessert? Well, yeah, what do you mean? That That's going to put equally as much of a strain. Now, the, the, the biggest issue we're seeing right now is, are you familiar with alcoholic fatty liver disease? I've heard of it, but I wouldn't say I'm familiar with it. Okay, I'm just curious because... What what used to be called alcoholic fatty liver has now been rebranded. It's now called, there's actually a different type too, called non-alcoholic fatty liver. Meaning that if you overload a liver for too long, it will actually start to store that fat initially on the liver itself. That's why if you've ever noticed when someone gains weight, where do you gain weight first? Around your midsection. Where's your liver? <laughs> Around your midsection. So that's what people don't understand. The reason we gain weight the way we do, and more importantly where we do, is simple logistics. Why am I going to transport that to your upper arm when I can just stick it right here on the belly? So you always gain from the inside up, and then you lose from the outside back down to the middle. The last piece of the puzzle being that belly fat specifically. So what happens is if you overstress a liver too long, let's just say you eat like most Americans, you're eating fast food, you're drinking six, seven Coca-Colas a day, chips, crackers, cookies, everything in between. Previously, the only way that you could do that much damage, more importantly, store that much fat on your liver itself was through alcoholism. You would have to drink close to six, seven, eight drinks a day doing the same thing. But the problem, Dallas, is we're starting to have children 14 years old with alcohol, well, not alcoholic, but non-alcoholic fatty liver. So they actually had to re-diagnose. They had to come up with a completely new disease state for this because he's 14 years old. Surely he's not drinking, <laughs> not just not drinking alcohol. He's not drinking alcohol in the amounts that we had previously seen that it would cause these things. Another very similar disease is type 2 diabetes. I don't call it type 2 diabetes. It's adult onset diabetes. That's what they yeah. used to call it. Then you got a 19-year-old sitting in your office with adult-onset diabetes. Your first question has to be, how bad is your diet? How have you been able to get seven Mountain Dews a day, ding-dongs, toaster strudels, fruity pebbles, Cheetos, chocolate milk? It never stops. So these kids are starting to get a fatty liver. And the problem with a fatty liver is not, fat on your liver is not the issue, but just like fat on your body, it starts to slow down how fast and, more importantly, how effective it can actually do its job. Hmm. I mean, that's that's a lot to take in. Um, and that's just food. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think, so what can we do to help our liver? So the, As far as not, you know, obviously not eating fat and junk foods, but are there certain vitamins that help these process it out, certain minerals? So just to or just eat good. Because I want to answer your question, so make sure I get back to that. But just to real quick, the first and foremost thing is get rid of the carbs and the sugar. Because fats are a part of, you mentioned, you said junk food and fat. Fat's not that tough on your liver, believe it or not. The hardest thing on your liver is simple carbs and sugar. That's the hardest one as far as processing goes. More importantly, that's going to raise your blood sugar. So when you raise your blood sugar, you come, it comes with a whole host of other issues. The pancreas has to get involved. All these other organs have to kick in. So the first and foremost thing you can do is get as much white, brown, yellow stuff out of your diet. Anything that's a cookie, a cracker, a cake, the super, super processed stuff. So there's a lot of different foods that specifically can kind of help. The main ones you want to sort of look for are things like that are high in B vitamins. Like that's not very complex necessarily. Most foods have some levels of either B6, B4 or something. But those are some of the main things that are take place with uh, or catalyze those reactions. So think things like niacin, choline, all those different things. So any type of foods, typically your eggs, different meats, cheeses, actually some grain products, rice, quinoa, all those types of things. So most of the foods you're eating have the stuff you need for phase one. Now some of the more complicated ones, specifically when you get into the sulfur foods, there's not a lot of high sulfur foods. There are some main thing I want to look at, though, and talk about is things like curcumin, or what actually makes turmeric yellow. That's what's used in a lot of curry in places like India and stuff like that. Those are super powerful to help start catalyzing those detox processes. I don't think I've ever eaten any curcumin or Well, it, curry is what you would eat it in. So there's yellow curry. That's never the one that's curry. high in sulfur. There's red curries. There's green curries. 
So each one is kind of different. Now, a lot of people are very familiar with grapefruit. Grapefruit is actually a not good for detoxing at all. Grapefruit, that's why they tell a lot of people who are on a lot of medications, stay away from grapefruit. Grapefruit, grapefruit actually slows down phase one detoxification. So that's even more interesting. That's what's going on is there's certain chemicals in grapefruit that slow the body's process down. Problem with that is that drug can stay in you 30, 40% longer. That's why a lot of people are their doctors specifically banned them from eating grapefruit juice at all. So if grapefruit slows it down, what speeds it up? So some of the other ones that speed it up, anything that's going to be high in magnesium, high in iron, the cruciferous vegetables, those are things like the broccolis. That's yeah. your Brussels sprouts. That's your uh, cauliflowers, kales. And you've ever noticed most of those have that little bit of a distinct bitter taste to them. That's the sulfur. That's what you're actually in there looking for and eating. So those are typically the ones that are going to help you the most in getting in catalyzing and getting that first process going and moving. More importantly, they also have the things for phase two. Everything that goes in is in line. So when you eat a cookie or a cracker, it basically gets in a queue. So it's just waiting for its time to be processed. Now let's say you're also on a prescription drug and you also took a couple Advil that day and then that night you had a couple drinks. Well, all of those things are starting to build up in that queue. That's why most of our, our most common thing that we see here as far as symptoms is fatigue. People are just worn out because it's not a free ride to run your organ. If that liver is working, even though you may be sitting still in your couch, there's energy that's being used to actually try to run these metabolic processes. The main thing is get away from the stuff that stresses it. So a salad is not going to stress your liver because none of that lettuce, spinach, whatever's in your salad can even turn to sugar or glucose. This means the liver is not involved. I don't have to even process this. This is fiber. This is roughage. So you want to get as close to whole foods as you can. Now, a big mistake on that. Most people, when they think whole foods, they immediately jump to fruit. Why? Well, fruit's easy to eat. <laughs> fruit's sweet. You're, you're opening up that same exact door again, though, with the fructose. That fructose is just as, whether it comes from high fructose corn syrup and fruity pebbles, or if it comes from fructose in a grape. It's the same exact molecule as far as your liver is concerned. This is what I ha try to stress to people. A lot of times there's a lot of foods that we assume are healthy that simply because of the way they get processed cause our body a little extra work. So they're not unhealthy. Grapes are not bad. They're not unhealthy for you. What else are you doing? How many drugs are you taking? How much Advil do you take? Yeah, I wanted to touch on that. So, you know, say someone's on heavy prescription drugs the body's obviously not used to those chemicals at first processing them, but, I mean, does the liver adapt over time and obviously become better at it because, you know, people are taking prescription drugs all the time. But I know you did some research before. What's the long-term effect of these drugs on the liver? So it's actually interesting. It's very similar to alcohol. If you've ever seen someone who's a heavy drinker, they can drink a lot more than you, can't they? That's because the liver actually is adaptive. If you keep having contact with a chemical or anything that it needs to synthesize, it will actually start to increase the amount of enzymes that it keeps on hand. Because it goes, hey, pretty much every day at 9, he's going to have a whiskey. <laughs> I better get ready for that whiskey. That's why people who go, let's say you go 6, 7 months without drinking, and then you go back to drinking. It hits you like a ton of bricks. Does that have anything to do with withdrawal, withdrawal symptoms from like heavy well, alcoholics? Well, it's not even withdrawal. Six months is going to be, you're going to be way past withdrawals. Withdrawals are going to be within the first no, month. No, yeah. Well, I meant like within the first week or so, some people can have withdrawals. That's a totally that's different process. That's something else. Okay. Just Your checking. body's starting to need alcohol. That's, a, that's even different. <laughs> what, what it really is, though, is when you go, like I said, six, seven months, your body stopped producing those enzymes because there's no thing coming in every day that it needs to use them all. So when you drink all of a sudden, the body goes, whoa, 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 whoa we don't have any of this on hand. we got to start making this from scratch. This is why people don't understand why a hangover feels like a hangover. It's not easy on your body to do all <laughs> of these things. You were also stayed up till 2 a.m., but your liver was working till about 5 a.m. It was easy to drink them. <laughs> Detoxing that alcohol out while you, while you were quote-unquote sleeping. That's the thing is a lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes. So let's get back, though. The main thing about prescription drugs, or really any drug, is it's not real in the sense of your body is concerned. It has never seen clozapam in nature. So you got to remember, we're old. We talk about this on most of our podcast episodes. Human beings have been around for a long time. You know what hasn't? Xanax. Uh, Percocet. 
ibuprofen, all of these things that we, a lot of them even are over the counter, right? You tell you, you know, I take a couple of leave every day. That's great, but that's hard on your liver. That's hard on your kidneys because it now has to figure out what this chemical is, and that's when this gets even more complicated. The liver is so complex, it actually has two major phases to detoxing. So it doesn't just grab a chemical, chop, 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 send it on. No. The first one is basically breakdown. It takes a molecule and it tries to make it smaller. Because if you really, this is what's kind of tricky as far as our, the average person is concerned. If you were to look up any of these drug molecules, more importantly, like think paint thinner molecules. Think any, any strong smelling type of thing. If you really looked at those under a microscope, they are enormous. They're huge. So the biggest problem is, first and foremost, the body's got to make that into something it can manage. Because remember, if you go back to glucose, that's C6H12O6. That's just a couple of carbons, some hydrogens, and some oxygens. That's pretty standard. When you start getting into some of these, especially the carcinogenic ones, you're getting into like huge, double-bonded, 36 long molecules. So the body, first and foremost, goes, I don't even know what to do with this. So it has these things called hydrolysis, oxidation. All, basically what it's trying to do is strip off hydrogen and oxygen molecules off of, these mo off, off of these huge chemicals. That's phase one. So phase one is to make it smaller. So the weird thing about your body is when it's in phase one, some of the things that it converts that initial chemical to are actually more damaging than the chemical. <laughs> because they're what we call, have you heard of free radicals? Yes, I have. So a free radical is just when you strip off an oxygen and it doesn't have anything to bind to. So an oxygen by itself does not like that. That's why, weirdly enough, that's why our, blood, our entire circulatory system works the way it does. That's why metal in the rain rusts. Oxygen is always trying to bind to something so that it can now react and be more stable. So we call those free radicals. Now, you've probably heard the term antioxidant, right? What do you think antioxidants do? Um, antioxidizes the free they, radicals. They, are, they basically take that oxygen species and give it something to bind to. So that's what's so weird is that we hear these words all the time. You never know what they mean. <laughs> no one ever helps you understand what is an antioxidant. Well, if you've got free radicals, they grab onto it, and it's now a stable molecule that's not going to harm you. So think when you think easy stuff as far as antioxidants go, vitamin C. That's the main antioxidant. It gives those oxygen species something to grab onto and stop doing the damage. So phase one is interesting because that's the first thing your body does. It's going to take everything and reduce, 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 smaller, smaller, smaller. The problem is, like I just said, a lot of them, it, it's always going to do phase one. Phase two is a lot trickier. Phase two actually needs you to be involved. Now, what I mean by that is if you don't have a certain things in your diet, the main one being sulfur, Again, real quick, think about how much sulfur is in your diet. Very little. Where would we even get sulfur? So sulfur is actually... I know, very, it, I know it's natural, right? It's but. actually a very tricky one to get because it does not taste or smell very good. So most people... Spanish black radish. If you've been to Naturally You before and you've taken Spanish black radish, the main ingredient and the main reason that Spanish black radish smells that way is an extremely high sulfur food. But people not coming to naturally or not on a program where would you naturally in your diet the easiest, get sulfur the easiest egg yolks that have yellow, sulfur. that yellow cover or that okay. yellow color that's actually some sulfur that's in there so that's hmm. what's so ironic about our nutrition advice we told people to cut the yolk out because we were <laughs> trying to cut out fat you know cuz fat was killing you that's a whole another episode we're going to get on on, a, on another day yeah. but yes that's one of the easiest ones. now most of your sulfur foods are going to be anything that smells really not sour, but really almost just that pungent. Think rotten eggs. That's that sulfur smell. So it ends up being a lot of things like celeries. One of the main ones is broccoli sprouts. If anyone has ever had sprouts, they don't really taste good. But when you eat them, there's something about them that your body likes. That's because you're getting specific molecules like sulfur, other amino acids, all that. Yeah, well, me and my wife, Martha Ann, we've started doing on Thursday, we just call it raw night, where we just raw vegetables, like awesome. just un uncooked broccoli and carrots. It's actually pretty good. Wow, so it's good I to know there's some, to this. <laughs> it's good to know there's some sulfur and broccoli. So yes, now, I'm getting my daily dose. Now, actually, broccoli is an interesting one because it's not as present in actual broccoli, but in, in broccoli sprouts, it's like 500% your daily value. It's Jeez. crazy. And it's actually. Can you overdose on sulfur? 
So again, can you? Sure. <laughs> you could just eat a sulfur brick and you'd be in it, trouble. Yeah. But as far as an organic version of food. You'll be fine. No. You probably won't be hungry by the time. Exactly. Well, the foods that I could, another one is asparagus. That's one of the reasons it makes your urine smell that way, is it actually has these different compounds in it. So we digress. To get back to phase two. Yeah, go ahead with phase two. And I have a question. Mainly, what happens after all these phases? But I'm sure you'll get there. Yeah, yes, it is. So that's the biggest issue. The reason I say that phase two is the most important is because, one, your body's going to do one regardless. Now, remember that Q is building up. So if you're also taking, like I said, prescription drugs, and you're eating a bunch of carbs, and you have a few drinks, and you smoke cigarettes, and, dan and, 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 and. They start to build up. So the problem with a lot of this is the, the phase ones, some of them are actually fat soluble. So some of them actually will be escorted away from the liver. Let's say you, stay, you stood in line at the airport too long. There's a point where you're going to stop standing in line. You're going to go somewhere else. Your body will actually do this. Because the problem with the way we live today is that sometimes we don't stop eating. We don't stop popping Advil. We don't stop drinking a Coke. All of those things keep building that cue up. So eventually, if the body breaks them down and they're stuck in the liver waiting for phase two to start, it'll actually shuffle them away to where? Your belly fat. So that's why we say a lot of people who cannot lose weight has nothing to do with their diet. They've got an excess of either different chemicals or heavy metals that the body has temporarily stored in its fat as to not fully damage the liver. More importantly, to not damage your small intestine, to not damage your large intestine, to not so, get it stuck in another organ point. So real quick, how long is the cue before this starts to happen? I mean, how backed up do you need to be as a healthy person with a normal liver, really? It going to start backing up? Well, or well, well, this is what's so interesting. It depends on your diet. Because if you don't have sulfur on hand, guess what you can't do? Phase two. Yeah. So that's okay. where this gets interesting. Phase one happens. That's why I say that's the yeah. passive one. No one has a choice. Phase two depends on you. Gotcha. Meaning if you're not eating a certain amount of, specifically, there's some amino acids like glycine and glutamine. And people have heard of glutathione. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yeah, I've heard of that one. These are all different things that are specifically used in phase two. The problem, you have to eat them. So that's why that cue will build and build and build. But with a normal body, they're going to happen almost immediately. Now, phase two does take a little more time, and phase two is different, whereas phase one is a strip down. Phase two is actually a build back up. So what it does is it takes other molecules and sticks them to the new one. So that's what it'll use sulfur for. If you stick sulfur onto some of these organic compounds, they now become neutral, and they want to be calm, and they're not reactive anymore. If you stick an amino acid group or a methyl group or a hydrogen onto some of these different molecules, they now become water-soluble. That's what's even more important about this, because now that they're water-soluble, they can move out in either your urine or the bile. So that's what's even more interesting about this, is the body has to break it down and then build it back up to something that can actually leave. That's why we have so many what, Dallas? What's our number one surgery in this country? Gallbladder. Do they know what the gallbladder does? What's the thing they do? We're don't? about to get into it. <laughs> so the gallbladder is essentially the cousin of the liver. Is that, that where does where does the liver send these molecules real quick afterwards? So they once they're ex, once the, once phase two because that's a good point. Once phase two ends, it, they're they're going to either end up into the large intestine or what we call the colon. That's your exit mm -hmm. channel. That's yeah. all that is. Or they end up in the urinary system. Okay. That's, that's water soluble stuff. So, so depending the, on which one it is, bile is fat soluble. It's toxins. Water or urine is water-soluble toxins. Gotcha. So the gallbladder, it's the cousin of the liver. So that's where this comes in to be interesting, because everybody and their mom knows about their gallbladder. Real quick, where is it even located? Because so <laughs> I could, could not see, find it. If you could see the liver, the gallbladder is this little pouch that sits right below and kind of in front of the liver. Okay. But it's about one-tenth the size of the liver. The liver is actually humongous. It's about the biggest organ other than your brain. And other, obviously your small intestines. Are yeah, your, yeah, yeah. That's, Those that's, are like miles, right? It's like 30 feet. <laughs> it's, like 30 feet. <laughs> it's like 30 feet, but we're only five, six feet tall, so that tells you how yeah, long it yeah, is. Yeah. But as far as like thickness, the liver is very large because it has to do so much. So the gallbladder is very interesting. Gallbladder only has one job, store bile. So you're thinking, wait, why are we taking so many people's gallbladders out? Do you know where bile comes from? I don't. The liver. Uh, so you did just say that. Though. So that's what's so crazy about this is we think our gallbladders are having issues when we start to get things like gallstones or we get gallbladder attacks. The problem is up the chain. 
the liver is who actually produces that bile. So besides breaking down your food, breaking down your drugs, the only way that you as a 70% water person can process fats, because we, we don't really think about this, mm -hmm. but why can humans eat butter? If we're 70% water, last I checked, oil and water don't mix. That's what bile is. Bile works exactly like Dawn soap does. There's a hydrophobic in and there's a hydrophilic in. That means there's a water liking or a side that the water can attach to. There's a side that the oil can attach to. So that's strangely the only way as humans that we can even process fats. That's why a lot of animals don't eat fat. They eat just grass. Their bodies say we don't have all of that type. We don't have gallbladders and cows. We don't have those types of organs. They're unnecessary. We're not even eating fat to begin with. We eat simply carbohydrates. So if you get your gallbladder out, I mean, are you going to be okay for the most part? A lot of people, I know they are. They don't die, but they can't be like good for your liver. Who is it harder on? Yeah. You just made the liver's job twice as hard. Because your liver makes bile usually in the evening when you're asleep, around 3, 4 a.m. That's when your body's actually producing what bile it may need. So it uses the gallbladder conveniently so it doesn't have to constantly do that. So the biggest issue with getting your gallbladder removed is now your liver has to make bile what? On command. So the problem is, remember that cue we talked about? Because you still take Advil. Yeah. You still are on your prescriptions. You still smoke cigarettes. You still eat foods, carbs, sugars. Now you ate a hamburger with french fries that are fried in oil. So now your liver has to stop that cue again and simply make bile so that it can assimilate that fat. You see how hard we end up being on our livers just by living what we would call normal lives. Our livers never stop working. The easiest way to think about this, if you open your mouth and put something in, your liver just started work. So you see how we never give it a break. And how long does the process take? If you say you ate a hamburger, one hamburger you didn't eat for 24 hours, how long would it take that liver to fully run through phase one, phase two, get it to you? So depending your on the hamburger, you're not really going to be doing phase one and phase two detox. That's just the metabolism side. Okay. That's when it's going to simply be making When things. there's chemicals, that's the phase. Okay. So say you take an aspirin. How long... I know you don't have an exact no, number. No, it but. mostly just depends on you. Do you have those phase two detox sulfur things stored in your liver and ready? Uh, okay. If you do, quit. No problem. Bam, bam, bam. A few hours, it's out. More importantly, if you've been taking asp a baby aspirin for 20 years and you've been eating a depleted diet and, 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 and. I got you. Yeah. Now the body goes, okay, I don't have enough <laughs> sulfur on board to even deal with all the stuff that's coming in. That's when it starts moving them to your fat tissue. The other problem is what are your other fatty organs? If you don't know, it's brain. Brain is your fattiest organ. So that actually will start to store things there. Also your endocrine glands, think thyroid, think pituitary, think adrenals. Those are fatty. So the biggest crazy part about all this is the most important organs end up being the ones that have to overcarry that burden for the liver. I think the craziest part about all this is that any of this actually works in conjunction with each other because this is amazing. <laughs> the, that's what I hope we learn during this podcast, Alice, is that the human body is absolutely unbelievable. It is the most complicated piece of machinery to ever exist and probably ever will. Simply your brain alone. like We haven't even talked about another organ. We're still just talking about the liver. So that's what's crazy. How do they all sync up? You made a great point. How does your liver know? How does your heart know? How does your kidney know? That's what your brain's doing. The old saying of you only use 10% of your brain. That's me and you having this conversation. The other 90% of your computing power is running this. Keep sulfur. Keep sulfur. <laughs> Tell them they want more. Why do, well, what piss them say, well, why do I like deviled eggs so much? You might be depleted on a specific, end. more importantly, nutrition. That's why this comes full circle back to Naturally You. That's what we're ultimately trying to do here. We're trying to figure out what specifically of all the stuff a liver uses or could need. What are you missing? What are you depleted on? What part, what specific, because again, that's why Spanish black radish is our number one seller. Most people's bodies respond so strongly to that because they've been so depleted, more importantly, for so long. Because I mean, I'm in my 20s. My body hasn't had enough time to even run out of things like sulfur and stuff like that. But when you get to your 40s, more importantly, your 60s, your 70s, and you've ne you haven't eaten sulfur for the last five decades, Dallas, how do you think your body's going to handle that? Not very well. So we start having these different diseases. We start having all these other problems that accumulate. Now, just to keep going, there's one last last real big one I want to talk about for that your liver does. Because we already know it makes bile. You know what else your liver makes? 
cholesterol. Really? The the scariest thing to happen to health and nutrition in the last 20, 30 years is cholesterol, right? So what people don't understand is that dietary cholesterol does not impact your blood cholesterol. I've, I've said it, and I'll say it again. The cholesterol you eat through food does not impact your, impact your blood cholesterol. Well, where does that come from, the thought that it does? The original studies were on mice. Oh, okay. So as you know, how much meat do mice eat? Not a, not a lot. I mean, not a lot at yeah, all. They not mice, m- mouses. Are... Technically omnivores, so they can, but yeah. most of their are going to be grasses, nuts, seeds, things like that. So you know who is very, very adversely impacted by cholesterol in the diet? Mice. Yeah. When you do those studies in humans, it doesn't change at all. Your liver, every day, makes the amount of cholesterol you need based on need, meaning cholesterol's main thing is it's an inflammation marker. So Cholesterol, that's why they have LDL and HDL, high density, low density. That means it's either leaving the liver, going to somewhere in the body. Low density is returning to the liver. That's why they call one good, one bad. Cholesterol is not good or bad. It's cholesterol, depending on what it's doing. So that's what's even more interesting. Your liver will make it based on need. So if you've got elevated cholesterol, you've got inflammation somewhere in your body that your body's trying to mitigate. So giving you a medication, who processes it? (laughs) The The liver. To artificially reduce how much cholesterol your liver can make is not going to make you healthy. Well, yeah, wouldn't that just mean you're not getting cholesterol to where you need it? it. Exactly. You're actually Achilles healing it. You're keeping it from (laughs) doing what it's trying to do, which is send more of this out to these inflamed areas. Now, the real solution, get away from the sugars and the carbs and all those. Well, that's not an option, Jordan. I'm sorry. (laughs) Exactly. Most people would say that. So that's what's so crazy about the liver is now, if you really look at it now, it's also in charge of hormone production. Now, the main reason you know that, every single sex hormone, estrogen and testosterone, you know what they're made out of? Cholesterol. Really? So that's how I did deep, not know that. That's how deep this goes. To make testosterone, your liver has to make cholesterol. So you see why statins cause so many issues because what's the big health scare we've got nowadays in our country? Low T. All these men have low T, low T, low T. Well, they've been on statin drugs for 20 years, which is keeping the precursor to testosterone from being made in the amounts it needs. What adds to the cholesterol to make testosterone? Like, where does it get the other chemicals? So it's just other amino acids. Other I mean, different. but is it made all in the liver? Or does no, no, the no. cholesterol go from the liver to, okay, okay. Well, testosterone, testes. Ovaries gotcha, make estrogen. Gotcha, 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 so gotcha, that's gotcha. just, so, but like you just said, where's our cholesterol come from, i.e.? If you don't give somebody two by fours, they can't build a house. Now, what? Tell me what a statin is, real quick. A statin. A statin. So I kind of want to save that for the cholesterol episode because we're gonna go way deep into okay, just yeah. cholesterol all by itself. Because that's literally. I've heard statin a lot, and I know that they're not good. Statins block the production. So there's one enzyme in your liver that helps reduce and create things into cholesterol. Statins block that. Gotcha. So basically, it just clips the heel of that of that enzyme so that it can't convert it into cholesterol yeah, we'll save that for the cholesterol so no, 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 good question i just I, that whole subject is, d- needs its own 15 minute <laughs> podcast because yeah. it's so crazy how much is going because we've gone into it a little bit but the thing is which, that's what i was saying so you see why the liver is so important it's it's the swiss army knife of the body it does specifically over 500 unique detoxes modifications production something So your liver almost never stops working. And that's why I tell people, this is what we don't understand by, every time you open your mouth and put something in, your liver just went to work. So you know why the number one symptom we see is fatigue. That's not a free ride. Well, if you eat three meals a day, I mean, does your liver ever stop working? (laughs) That's a great point. No. You see why that cue keeps getting longer and longer and longer. More importantly, what's it doing during the night while you're actually not eating? Making bile. So you see why so we it's have, still work. <laughs> so you see why we are so hard on these bodies without even realizing we're being hard on these bodies. They never get a break. That's why things like fasting are so important. When you fast, that liver doesn't have anything to do except for what? Regulatory things. Let's make some cholesterol. Let's get some bile out there. You can actually, build up your reserves. I actually don't have anything to do. Now yeah. the other thing the liver's in charge of is glycogen storage. So Glycogen is how you store your temporary, if you want to store carbs or quick energy and you don't want to convert it all the way to fat, your liver actually holds on to that. 
your liver also is in charge of taking insulin because it, what insulin is are what we call the fat storage hormone. So your pancreas secretes insulin. It grabs excess glucose. Guess where it takes it? The liver. The liver then breaks that insulin down and turns that excess glucose into, into fat. So that's what's crazy. The liver is pretty much the, where the hammer meets the anvil on 90% of the processes happening in your body today. So this is where we're starting to cause our issues. We're all taking Advil every day. We're taking prescription drugs like Adderall every single day. We smoke two packs a day. We jewel. We drink Coca-Colas. We eat. We, our liver never gets a chance to breathe. More importantly, you've got all those phase one leftovers still floating around, begging you to eat some sulfur, begging <laughs> you to add some amino yeah. acids, begging you to add these things that it, so we can finish the job. While the problem is that cue keeps growing. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and more and more, and that's why we start to feel so crappy. So my synopsis on the liver is take care of it because it's going to take care of you. You have to. And like I said, the problem is you can at least get on dialysis. That's not a long-term solution by any means. But you cannot replicate what this organ does. That's why they're looking at regrowing. And neither can, yeah, neither can people. So if it goes, see ya. That's why we're looking at trying to regrow people's livers in a lab. Because the liver is a very interesting organ in that sense. It's the only one that will regenerate itself. I mean, as great as that sounds, that's still like... You should. That shouldn't be the goal. I'm just going to destroy my liver. We can regrow yeah, let one. Me it's run fine. This into the earth. Yeah, it's <laughs> fine. Let me just destroy it. No, take care of yourselves, people. So yeah, the liver again. I, that's what I hope to get through this podcast. And then as we go through all the organs, it's complicated. That's what is so hard about the way we eat and our diets is we just think you know I took some Advil, <laughs> whatever. My headache's gone. I don't. I mean, whatever. No, that was a huge stack of work that you just dropped on that liver. So again, you also went to Cock of the Walk, and then you went and got a Pepsi, and then you got a pack of cigarettes. Those are all things the liver specifically is responsible for. It's his job. So how would you feel if you never got a break from work? Tired. And pissed off. Yeah. That's why, too, the, just to end on this, too, if you look in ancient Chinese medicine, the liver is associated with anger. That's the organ that, that's, you ever heard of the old angry alcoholic Mm -hmm. there's a reason for that you don't feel good when your liver is not functioning properly that's why a lot of times when you see people who eat junky food and they have short tempers and they got a quick fuse they don't feel good Dallas that's what's really hard and kind of sobering to realize is oh man you're not just a jerk you feel terrible yeah of course you do you've got all of these things that are just not getting finished they're not getting completely broken down and removed so yeah you're not going to feel good at all and i would say not that it was intentionally this way but thanks to you you help me and listeners understand how all this works together because these names of these chemicals glycogen and all these different bonds and stuff when you hear that it just goes over your head but you're able to piece it together and make it flow and kind of understand the process to where in school, you know, in school you're not in the right mindset to learn these things as a teenager anyway. Of course. But that, that's the real issue is you're, <laughs> one, you're not even ready. Two, you don't want to. Three, the words are hard. And I'll be honest, you know, I don't consider myself dumb, but, you know, you hear that, you're just like, okay, yeah, yeah, glycogen. And, and yeah. You, know, you know what a lot of what you haven't heard me say? P450. That, does that mean anything to you? Nope. That's, that's just the enzyme that actually does a lot of this work. There's no reason for us to talk about that. Yeah. All you need to know is your liver makes an enzyme that breaks down the products. But we've done the research. So that's what, I, that's what I hope to do with this, is just make it as simple and straightforward and the easiest way to think about your liver. And this is why I want people to start being nice to their liver. Look into things like intermittent fasting. Look into things like giving your body a break by not putting something in your mouth. The main thing is, you ever seen those old cartoons that have a little in-box and an out-box and guys at a desk working? That's your liver. So just about the time lunch is over, it's 3, 4 p.m., guess what your boss comes in? He drops a huge stack of papers and says, looks like you're working all night. That's how our livers feel. But but I'm supposed to be on vacation and... Uh... Was that from Office Space? He's like, oh, that's, that's my stabler. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, this has been The Liver, and I'm Dallas, and this is Jordan. Come see us at Naturally You, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>